Hey, Soul City Church, this is Pastor Eugene Cho joining you from Seattle, Washington. And I want to take a moment to thank you so much for allowing me to share and teach from the scriptures to your church today. And a special thank you to your respective pastors, Jeannie and Jared and your entire leadership team. This isn't quite what any of us envisioned joining you here virtually, but I do look forward to being able to join you in Chicago at your church at some point again in the future. How's that for a self-invitation again? If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Listen now for the word of God. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, Soul City Church, I suspect that no matter where you might be on your spiritual journey and relationship with Christ, every single one of us, we have certain Bible passages or stories that particularly resonate with us. Well, for me, John 21 happens to be among my all-time favorite stories in the Bible. Now, there's two reasons why I love this story. Number one, I love the outdoors, anything outdoors, particularly hiking. I love the ocean. I love lake, and I especially love fishing. Anytime I have any free time, I love to get my rod and my reel and my lures and be out on the lake to do bass fishing. And so I thought, just for the sake of illustration, I would show you a picture of a recent bass that I caught here in the larger Seattle area. Here it is. Now, you might be wondering, what's the purpose of showing this photo within this sermon? And the truth, friends, is there is absolutely no purpose or point. Like all fishermen, I just love showing pictures of my recent catches. Now, there's a second reason why I love this story. It's because 
it's not just a fishing story. There's actually something much more profound and raw and honest and vulnerable that's happening underneath this story. It's about doubt and confusion. It's about giving up and tiredness and weariness and cynicism. It's about God's grace. It's about all of these things. In many ways, I truly believe that when Peter says, I'm going fishing and I'm not alone, many theologians and pastors, we believe that when Peter says, I'm going fishing, what he's really saying is, I'm done. I quit. I want to go back to what I was doing before I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to pause here just for a moment and ask you this question. Does that resonate with you in some way or another? Amid all of the chaos and confusion and conflict and trauma of the past year and a half, In your life, in your city, in our nation, and around the world, is it possible that some of you right now, you're hanging on just by a thread? You're not announcing it, you're not sharing it, but somewhere within your soul, you just want to quit. Now, what do I mean by the collective national city and global trauma? Well, just to give you a short list We have been in an unprecedented global pandemic. 600,000 lives here in the United States have been lost. Globally, several million human beings. The economic impact and joblessness, illnesses. How about the intensity and the trauma of the most contentious election season in modern American history? The insurrection on January 6th, social unrest and protests, black and brown sisters and brothers and neighbors experiencing pain and trauma, the rise of anti-Asian hate, strained relationships and families in churches. I don't know about you, but I need to take a breath. I'm just talking about the collective stuff and not even talking about personal experiences that you and I have experienced. So perhaps you also resonate with the crux and point of this story. That when Peter says, I'm going fishing, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm so weary of the unknown, the unprecedented, I'm too whatever it might be, I'm weary, life is too complicated, too messy, or perhaps that line that some of us have echoed or thought in our minds, this is not what I signed up for. You see, when Peter says, I'm going fishing, I do believe what he was saying is, I want to go back to what I was doing before I encountered Jesus. And as you know, Peter was a professional fisherman. He made a living, particularly in this sea of Galilee. And this story, for some of you who might be familiar with the Old Testament, there's a parallel story about the Israelites in their wandering through the desert for 40 years, even as they were rescued and liberated from bondage and oppression and tyranny, some of the Israelites in the desert, they said what? We want to go back to Egypt because when we encounter trauma or pain or fear or anxiety, if you're anything like me, there's a temptation of wanting to go back to the familiar, even if it's not in the destiny of God's flourishing for my life. So let me pause here again and say, Is it possible that right now, where you are, in Chicago, in your church, you in your own life, some of you are tired, exhausted, weary, life is complicated, messy, and you're just hanging on. And if so, I truly believe the Holy Spirit has a word for you. Not a flippant word. 
Not a haphazard, surface, light, hope word, but a word from Scripture that I do pray encourages each and every single one of you. So friends, on that note, I want to share with you five practical things that we can learn from this passage that I pray will give you strength and a reminder of God's grace. Here's point number one. It's the most important thing. It's three words, and it's the most important three words that I believe you need to know You need to remember, you need to pray, you need to recite, you need to sing over your life again and again. Here it is, point number one, three words. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. Three words, here it is. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Soul City, I know that today isn't Easter Sunday, it's not Resurrection Sunday, Every single day, every single time we gather as the people of God, we rejoice in Christ crucified and Christ risen. In other words, as we read this story in John 21, amid all the details and nuances of fishing and swimming and the breakfast story, what might get lost is that Jesus, this historical man of Nazareth, who was alive, who wandered the earth publicly for three years, Alive for 33 years, this man was brutally killed and crucified, was buried behind the tomb. This man is now alive and walking. In other words, this Jesus is who he says he is and that Jesus is trustworthy. He will accomplish what he said he will accomplish. He is indeed Lord, Savior, and Messiah He is worthy of our worship. And I'm not suggesting that following and believing in Jesus simply makes everything perfect here on this earth, but we still need to remember that amid all the chaos, Jesus is still alive and God is still on his throne. It's the perspective that we need in our lives. And maybe more so now, when it feels as if the winds of our culture and society are blowing with such intensity. As you know, this is the third time in which Jesus appears to the disciples. As it says in our passage, scriptures record 12 different unique instances in which the risen Christ appears publicly. Again, to give us truth and veracity that Christ is alive. That's the first thing that I want to encourage you with. Don't forget this. Here's the second thing that we can learn from our passage, and it's this point, the human obsession with clarity. Now, what do I mean by the human obsession with clarity? A better translation, a more candid translation, is that human beings, you, I'm talking about you, me, every single one of us, No matter what our personality types, our backgrounds, our ages, our ethnicities, no matter what your enneagrams might be, every single one of us, we want to be in control. Now, let me talk about this story. I can imagine the disciples having an emotional roller coaster experience with Jesus devastated, crestfallen, fearful, anxious amid the capture and the crucifixion of Jesus. He comes back. They feel his wounds. They hear once again the invitation, the instructions of Jesus to go into Jerusalem, into Judea, into Samaria, the ends of the earth, to baptize all people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible thing. And then Jesus disappears from one of his physical resurrection appearances, and I can just imagine the disciples looking around, having a rah-rah moment, and then saying, "Um, how do we do this? 
What's going on? Have you ever had a moment or moments in your life where you believe God gave you a word? Where you felt like Jesus gave you a vision? Where you felt the Holy Spirit give you a prompting in your life and you're experiencing the spiritual intimacy and euphoria and for whatever reason the next day, the next morning, the next week, the next month, you're wondering, okay, I'm so confused. What do I do? How do I do this? God, what's going on? Have you ever thought to yourself as you experience resistance or oppositions or whatever it might be, you mutter the words, this is not what I signed up for. And I truly believe that the disciples, they wanted to have absolute clarity about the how and they didn't quite know what to do. And as a result, they began to spiral into anxiety and fear. I'm going fishing. I want to just go back to what I was doing when life was so much more simpler. When I became a follower of Jesus at the age of 18, I began to pray daily, regularly, several times a day, the prayers of clarity. I would ask God, God, would you show me my future? Can you show me exactly what my major, what my profession, what my future spouse, what my future family, can you show me the specific details of my life? And as I look back, Right now, Eugene Cho turning 51 in a couple months, as I look back now from my perspective, looking at the 18-year-old Eugene, I am so grateful that God did not answer those constant prayer requests for clarity to 18-year-old Eugene. Because had God told 18-year-old Eugene that rather than following through to a promise that I had made to my parents to be a doctor, that I would feel called, convicted to go into ministry, called to be a pastor, and as a result, having strained relationships with my parents, resulting in being disowned for a couple years. Had God told 18-year-old Eugene that I'd be called into a cross-cultural marriage growing up here in the U.S., marrying a woman, an amazing, beautiful woman from South Korea, that we would have three amazing children, and yet one of them would have a, a lifelong health chronic illness. And we would spend not just days, not just weeks, not just months, but years upon years even right now, going to doctor after doctor after professional after expert after expert, having weepless nights upon weepless nights. Had God told 18-year-old Eugene that in trying to start a church, planning a church here in urban Seattle, that things didn't quite go as well as I had hoped in my 20-year Excel sheet plan, and rather than planting a church successfully in the first year, I would be unemployed on food stamps and eventually find a job as a custodian at a Barnes & Noble store. And friends, it's not that that job was beneath me. That's not what I'm trying to say. Please hear that well. What I'm saying is that that was not part of my perfect plan for myself. Are you feeling me? And so as a result, I can still recall feeling so fearful and anxious. And here's the thing, I'm so grateful that God didn't reveal absolute clarity to 18-year-old Eugene because had I known such things, I would have ran the other way. I'm not suggesting that God made a mistake because that would probably be not the most theologically sound answer. But sometimes I wonder, God, maybe did you reveal too much information to Jonah? 
And Jonah, in his immaturity, is unable to handle this revelation, and he literally runs the other way. Friends, the gospel is not clarity. The gospel is not Jesus saying, I will show you every single exact specific step of the way. The good news is not clarity. The good news is the gift and the presence of Jesus himself. Matthew 28, 20, he promises that he will be with us always. Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the good news. I love the wisdom of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In one of his sermons, speaking about faith, he writes these words. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. So place our faith not in the details, but in the one who has the world in his hands. Friends, here's point number three. We must learn to hear the voice of God. In the story, initially, the disciples have no idea who this voice is coming from afar. And this voice asks the most ridiculous question. The voice says, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, really quickly, I wish I could explain this deeply, but just really quickly, I want you to know that when Jesus asks a question in the Gospels, it's never for his own benefit. In other words, if Jesus was here right now at your church, he would never ask, how do I find the restroom? Because Jesus is all-knowing. He knows all the answers. So when he asks questions, it's not for his benefit. It's for you. There's something in that engagement in which Jesus wants you to learn something underneath the question. So what is it here that Jesus wants you to know? You see, you've got to realize that Peter, along with several of the disciples, these folks were incredibly gifted fishermen. They had a small business. They fished the Sea of Galilee literally thousands upon thousands of times. They knew the best times, the best spots, the best methodologies, and the list goes on. Let me give you an example. I love fishing, and so because I love fishing, I have several rods, many lures, many techniques. I have a 5-6 rod, a 6-foot rod, a 6-6 rod. I have a 7 rod. I have an 8-foot rod, and then I have saltwater rods. I have uh, uh, um, light rods, medium rods, and heavy rods. I have bait casters and spinning rods. There's different kinds of lures that I use. For example, if I were to just use plastic worms, uh, you can uh, fish uh, worms through Let's see, there's uh, wacky rigs and Texas rigs and Carolina rigs. There's Neko rigs and the list goes on and on. My point is probably 99% of you, I'm a better fisherman than you. And Peter and the disciples, they knew what they were doing. But the point that Jesus is trying to make is even if you think You're an expert. Even if you think you're in control, even if you think you have expertise and power for us as followers of Jesus, listen to this carefully, apart from Jesus in the marathon of life, it's not sustainable. We can do nothing. Part of what it means to follow Jesus is that we're learning what it means to listen to the voice of God. And that's part of the story is that eventually they begin to listen to this voice that says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And in doing so, they become fruitful 
successful bringing in 153 fish. Really interesting point. 153 fish is not random. During this time of Jesus' life here on earth, there were 153 known species of fish. Connect the dots. Friends, why is this so important to us today? Because we're told research upon research, we are living in the most noisiest time in human history. The average American over the age of two and different research and resources cite different statistics. But on the average, the average American over the age of two watches, consumes, eats about five hours and 45 minutes, about six hours of television and media, TV, tablets, computers, about six hours Every single day, all of it with some kind of an agenda, some kind of a message. That translates to about 38 hours to 40 hours of media every week. That means the average American will spend about nine and a half years glued to all the messages of media over a 65-year life span. That's stunning. If Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, fully God, fully human, chose to regularly, rhythmically retreat for silence and prayer and time with God the Father, how much more do we need this gift, rhythm and discipline in our lives? Here's number four, quickly. Our emotions matter, but we don't worship our emotions. Now, this might be controversial, and I'm not sure if I have ample time to explain this, but let me affirm the importance of our emotions and our feelings. Why? Because God created us with feelings and emotions. So we should be aware. We should be sensitive. They matter. We should pay attention to these things. We should be mindful of these things. But there's a difference between being sensitive and aware to our feelings and emotions, seeing them as one part of numerous parts of our creation that God made us to be, there's a difference between that and being enslaved by our feelings so as to suggest and say that that's the prime and the exclusive feature that guides all of our decisions and thought process. Translation, we don't worship our feelings. I say this, friends, because over the years as a pastor, I've seen an incredible growth and spike of responses among Christians who say to me, well, Pastor Eugene, I don't feel like it. I don't feel God. I don't feel like working. I don't feel like worshiping. I don't feel like serving. I don't feel like giving. I don't feel like forgiving. I don't feel like staying in this marriage. I don't feel like fill in the blank. Now again, there is room and space for our feelings as raw and as vulnerable as they may be. But we have to make sure that it is not the most dominant or the only thing that guides our decisions. Now, we know that Peter was incredibly emotional. He wore his feelings on his sleeves and Jesus receives him and commissions him and is able to use him. But I think part of what we see in Peter's life is growth in this emotional maturity. Now, I'm going to rush to our last point, friends. And here's point number five. And here it is. Come and have breakfast. Can you imagine how the story would have unfolded had Jesus responded to Peter and the other disciples in dramatically different ways? This Jesus, who knows all things, Knowing that Peter, in saying, I'm going fishing, he was really saying, I'm done, I quit, I'm finished, I want to go back to what I was doing. 
Like, what if Jesus responded with the silent treatment? Arms folded, shaking his head. Heavy breath. What if Jesus responded with the one word responses? What if Jesus said, really? Seriously? Again? Or what if he escalated the intensity of his words? What if Jesus said, Peter, you're a failure. I'm done with you. I can't ever use you again. What if Jesus said, Peter, you're not enough. My destiny over you is no longer legit. You're not the rock. You're unreliable. You're soft. I'm done. On a human level, I actually believe that Jesus could have said those things. I know for me, in my interpersonal friendships or relationships, there are moments out of my emotions I have said, and there are times these words have been said unto me. But here's Jesus. And I can just imagine him doing this. And as Peter and the others draw closer, he points to the food and he says, come and have breakfast. If you want an example of one of the most incredible stories of the grace, the compassion, the empathy of Jesus. It's this story here. Jesus cares for each and every single one of us. He wants to feed us and nourish us and replenish us, especially those, any of you who are on the edge of giving up. Rather than words of scolding or condemnation, come and have breakfast. But friends, I also want you to know that this isn't just a feel-good, fuzzy breakfast story. As he nourishes them, as he feeds them, he also reminds them, recommissions them. He re-empowers them. By simply, if you read the entirety of John 21, go and feed my sheep. Go and do the things that I've called you to do. You might not know all the specific details, but I will be with you always. So friends, as we close, Soul City Church, know this right now. Whoever you are, whatever you're going through, Jesus is with you. Jesus desires to feed, nourish, replenish you. And Jesus wants to remind all of us to come and follow him. So God, thank you again so much for this opportunity, even virtually, to gather with my sisters and brothers at Soul City Church. God, I especially want to pray for anyone right now who might be on the edge of giving up, quitting. Would you give them a word of your amazing grace, restore and replenish them. And for each and every single one of us, amid, yes, difficult, challenging times in our city, in our nation, and around the world. God, we worship not our feelings, not our the desire to be in control. But we again profess that you are alive, that you're in control, and that we desire to continue to follow you. Father, may it be so. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Hey, I'm Jarrett Stevens. And I'm Jeannie Stevens, and we want to welcome you to the Soul City YouTube channel. As the lead pastors of Soul City Church, we just want to say how excited we are that you're joining with us here online. We hope that you've been encouraged and impacted during your time with us here and that you would actually share and, and comment on our videos so we can keep on engaging with you. Yeah, and we wanna make sure that you join us during our live services each week so that our church can connect with you in real time. The other thing that we'd love for you to do is hit the subscribe button so that you can stay connected to all that's going on in and around Soul City Church. And if you have kids, make sure to check out our Soul City Kids channel. It's filled with phenomenal Bible stories and adventures for kids of all ages, where they can actually grow their faith in a fun and engaging way. To learn more about all the ways that you can engage with us and experience spiritual transformation from wherever you're at, just visit our website at soulcitychurch.com. Yeah, and just know that we love you, that we're grateful for you, we're praying for you, and thanks for visiting us here today. We hope it's been a gift to you. We look forward to connecting with you soon.